Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you, if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White, or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader, and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult, and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better, how do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast, enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Sandaris, and Jerry is the superintendent of the Santa Fide School District. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. To kick us off, a bit about what you do, uh, a little bit about the district and, and your role. 
Sure. We're a district of about 41,000 students. We're in the heart of Orange County, Southern California. Um, we are a very high dense populated area and uh, a blue collar area that is socioeconomically uh, disadvantaged. And so we have a lot of blue collar workers and, uh, and uh, you know, just uh, challenge with the, the challenges that come with um, a, a high density population that uh, is trying to, you know, survive economically. Yeah, absolutely. No, I appreciate you sharing a little bit about that. Um, I, story, Jerry, let's start by um, asking about growing up, you know, when you were, when you were growing up, what were some of the moments or themes that really shaped you into the person and leader you are today? Yeah, no, uh, growing up, it was, uh, I'm the youngest of three uh, children, and there was a 10 and 11 year difference between my siblings and myself. And uh, my, my parents were blue collar workers, they worked graveyard and uh, different shifts to be able to stay home and take care of the family best of their ability. Um, so, but education really wasn't really a priority or wasn't a focus. Uh, at the time, it was, you know, just trying to do your best to put food on the table, roof over our heads. And I think uh, the thing that kind of resonated with me was uh, growing up was the fact that, you know, we had to, we had to, my siblings and myself had to oftentimes get uh, jobs during uh, school in order to help offset the family income because uh, my parents were seasonal workers and it was just, um, you know, the work ethic. I think that's where we instilled the work ethic in, in ourselves as growing up uh, in that type of home environment. And just remembering the various jobs that we had and really uh, work being more of a priority than education, but over time things changed and um, they changed as a result of my parents really wanting me and my siblings to not have to do the work that we were doing uh, or that they were used to doing and they wanted us to have a better life and really um, did their best to steer, to steer us away from the, the blue collar uh, work and more towards the educated work. We have the knowledge and skill set to help us with homework, but they did have the work ethic and, and the words to encourage us yeah. to do better. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's amazing about how they prioritize that for you in terms of your education. Um, do you remember your first leadership opportunities? You were, maybe it was when you were really little, maybe it was in your 20s, you know, where you was it sport or, you know, a chance to actually take on a project, a chance to lead a group of people. What comes to mind? So it was, it was in sports and it was in, uh, I played baseball growing up and I had the opportunity to be a catcher and in some sense, the catcher in a baseball team is kind of like the captain of the team. And we're calling pitches. We you know, take certain positions based on the batters that were coming up. But at a very early age, I really kind of um, had the opportunity to feel for that type of leadership. And I really, it really made me feel valued. It made me feel important. And because my responsibility was, you know, at a very young age to kind of pull people together and make sure we were functioning um, to bet to the ability collectively. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what happened for you after sort of school? And, you know, tell us a bit about your journey uh, from that point and, sure. and, and, you know, your first sort of opportunities um, in work and the like. Sure, sure. Uh, well, you know, like I said, we, we education wasn't academically aware. It was, it was our goal. Uh, but it, it, it graduating from high school, I wasn't the the smartest student in class. And so uh, as my friends were getting letters, uh, college acceptance letters to four universities, I was uh, facing life after high school um, and not knowing what I wanted to do. I wanted to get an education, but I didn't really. I went to a community college.
I mean, some experiences there that were similar to high school ended up getting uh, moving from one community college to another based on academic probation and um, really struggled to try and be a good student because I had to work and I had to, to go to school at the, at the time. And so long story short is I ended up uh, graduating. It took me about 12 years to graduate with a four-year degree. And when I did graduate, I graduated from a state college with a degree, with a degree in finance and ended up getting a job uh, as an accountant. I, not necessarily the job that I wanted mm. uh, with a business degree, but ended up getting a job as an accountant and very quickly realizing that it was a job that I did not enjoy one bit. And um, I remember going to work every day, being at a desk, a computer, you know, uh, crunching the numbers and not really being able to interact with anybody or having the ab ability to kind of just get out and grow as a, as a professional. And so my wife was going to school to be a teacher at the time. And she said, hey, why don't you get your, go back and get your transcripts analyzed and become a substitute until you figure out what you want to do. So I went and got my transcripts analyzed. And because I had a degree in finance, I was able to teach math. And the math at that time was a very high demand area. So uh, rather than subbing, they uh, disregarded me as a math teacher. And at that point, I knew I was in the right place and never looked back. Wow. Yeah, that's um, incredible. So as you've, as you've then um, grown in, uh, you know, as an educator, but also as a leader, are there any mentors that that come to mind who have been particularly influential along the way that you've led with or you've watched them lead? Absolutely. I, I have I have numerous mentors that have tapped me on the shoulder, that have uh, guided my decision-making, that have encouraged me when I didn't believe I was the right person for the job, leadership positions, uh, numerous individuals that um, have made me the superintendent that I am today. And if you were to ask me when I graduated from high school or even college, uh, if I ever thought I was going to be a superintendent of public education or ever wanted to, um, the answer would be no. I never in my wildest dreams that I believe I would be uh, running a large urban school district uh, like I am right now because education was more of a challenge for me um, as I was growing up and, and evolving in my career. Yeah, I think and I think your story is is incredible, and uh, I can reflect. You know, to, to actually achieve so much, when, like you said, if 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 anyone had even asked you back then, you wouldn't have had any idea um, that you would be doing it. Maybe even that you had the potential to do this. I, I don't know. You can you can answer that, but I think you you're a, you're a remarkable leader. You've done. A, how have you been able to do that from a place where, like, you really believe there's been some of the in that way after having no idea you'd be yeah. back then? Well, I, I, you know, as a, and I get asked that question a lot, you know, as I've evolved as a superintendent in various uh, platforms. But I think the thing that, keep, that I keep going back to is somebody seen something in me that I didn't. Somebody tapping me on the shoulder and saying, you need to do this. Being there to support and encourage my uh, thought process and my the validation that I do belong, capable of being a leader, whether it's uh, taking on a lead as a classroom teacher or uh, previously I was a high school principal and then um, move on, moving on to district office positions where ultimately now I'm, I'm the superintendent running. Um, running the entire district and the operations. But it, the, what, what, what it was is people just seeing something in me and believing in me where I did not see that capacity or believe that I belonged. Can you think of some of the moments where people have done that? Uh, mind where you remember having a bit of an epiphany because someone said, hey, this is what I see over your life this is what i see that you're capable of or uh, you know any any specific stories or moments along the way where people have tapped you on the shot yes 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 the most recent one was probably about 12 
about 13 years ago when I first became a superintendent. I was serving as an assistant superintendent in a small urban district in uh, Southern California. And at the time, my current superintendent was, was, was ill. He was often ill and a lot of times he, he would come to work and then have to I'll miss a few days. And so, so a lot of times I, find he, I found substituting for him in various meetings and various functions. And finally, it got to the point where his illness just was getting the best of him and he had to retire. And I remember him sitting down with me and saying, hey, are you ready? And I remember looking at him and going ready, you know, talk, having a conversation, ready for what? And he goes, I'm going to recommend you to be the superintendent. And I said, Jim, I said, I, um, I don't want the job I'm, and I'm not, I'm not, you know, I don't think I, I, I'm not ready for it. And he goes, he goes, you're ready for it. You're more than ready for it. And he said something that really hurt me at first, but then reflecting on it really empowered me. And he goes, Jerry, he goes, stop being so selfish. And I looked at him and I was offended at that comment. And I remember getting upset, standing up and getting ready to walk out the door. And he, he said, don't you dare slam that door. And I, and I paused and I looked at him and I said, it's selfish if I want your job, not selfish to say no. And he goes, it's not about you, Jerry, because it's about what you represent. It's about the people that look like you and the role model that you will serve for those that come after you. And we ended up exchanging a few more words, and then I ended up leaving. And I remember going home and not being able to sleep at all that night and waking up in the morning. And I <laughs> leaned over to my wife and I said, hey, I said, you know, how do you feel about me taking the superintendent job and she was like I think you'd be great and I think the only one that didn't think I would be great would be me <laughs> and that's the self-doubt that you know I think growing up in the environment that we had which was you know working class environment trying to struggle for for a lot of things growing up and just that self-doubt that you know it, that wasn't my role or that wasn't my family's role but to be in a position now where I have all of these voices telling me, no, you got this, you can do it. And it really took a leap of faith. And, and I ended up saying yes, and I ended up getting the position. But I remember when I got the position, I was like, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> and um, <laughs> that, again, reaching out to my other superintendent colleagues, colleagues that saw me in meetings for the first time, that saw my, the look on my face and reached out to me and said, hey, Here's my cell phone number. We're here to support you. Here, here are some things that, you know, I experienced when I first became superintendent. Please call me and we can talk and we can, you know, walk through this, whatever, this transition. And so that was the moment when my mentor, uh, my previous superintendent, really um, changed my, my life and, and really empowered me to become the leader that, that I that I aspire to be today. And and I remember oh, getting the job and thinking. That's a good story. I remember getting the job and thinking I'm going to be the shortest superintendent in history in this district um, because the job is so challenging, right? And being a new person, not knowing yeah. what what is really involved. And now I'm in my I think it's my 14th year. <laughs> uh, there's so much I love that story. Um, <laughs> I, mentor had a lot of guts to say that to you. And yeah. um, just, <laughs> I love, I love the, uh, I love your response. Of, Don't you dare slam that door. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sleep. yeah. What a, what a great, uh, what a great man. Um, <laughs> excuse me. I'm interested. I think a lot of leaders deal with self doubt and this imposter syndrome. Yes. At different levels. Um, it's something I hear all the time when I'm, when I'm working with leaders. So a couple of things I hear in that story is you obviously had people who believed in you. You've had colleagues who've said, hey, give me a call. And, and they've, you've been able to yeah, chat with them. People have sort of gone before. What have you learned about with self-doubt? For those listeners who might be position or, or considering something where they have a lot of self-doubt, how have you learned to manage that and, and overcome it? Well, it, it's, a, it's a constant battle. So I've been doing this for 14 years and, you know, I still feel that uh, imposter syndrome when I go into certain meetings and certain uh, events. 
because I just don't look like others and I don't feel like I, I'm not a doctor, right? So I, I never went and finished and completed my doctorate. I did try to get my doctorate, but life happened and I had to withdraw from the program. But I'm often around a lot of professionals that do have their doctorate degrees. And so um, the self-doubt kicks in even 14 years into the superintendency and 26 years in public education. But the way I, you know, I just overcome it is, one, um, the people that reach out to me take advantage of the job alone. There have been times when I tried to do this job alone and I tell a story where I've been in the hospital times throughout my career. All three times they've been stress related. And recent time, which was about seven years ago, for a heart. And my doctor, uh, after running all kinds of tests, came in and he goes, I got good news and I got bad news. I said, What's the good news? He said, The good news is we ran the x rays and the tests and everything came back negative. And a sigh of relief, you know, thinking, Oh, thank God, nothing's seriously wrong with me. I said, What's the bad news? He goes, the bad news is if you don't change what you do, you're not going to walk out of here next time. And that really resonated with me. And so I was trying to internal to do the job all by myself. I was trying to, to make decisions because I didn't want people to feel like when I asked that I didn't, I was incompetent. And it was really at that point when I'm laying on a hospital bed with oxygen tubes and my nose looking at the lights on the ceiling thinking this is not worth it and so the way i've been dealing with it on a daily basis is just reaching out to my network identifying those professionals that i um, admire that i respect and i try to surround myself with those individuals and have conversations bounce things off of them to help guide my decision making process and then make the best decision i can for for me, for my organization. And then the other thing is the way I kind of uh, get um, like the social emotional help is being um, a mentor to others. And um, cases like this, I do not hesitate to take any chance I get to share my story and you know maybe answer any questions that may help others in the profession. Wow. Um, what a... Um <laughs> Another profound moment. With that, with the doctor talking to you. Um, so, in in the past seven years, I can hear that one of the big things you've done is, is reached out and more proactive, even when you, you feel, feel uh, there's something holding you back, like you don't want to overload other people, or you know, but you're actually going, no, I'm just going to reach out for help and and to get others involved. What yeah. else have you done to manage, manage that, that stress? The job superintendent of schools. So, yes. So, <laughs> How have you, what else have you found um, that's worked for you in, in how you do life and that work life to, to manage that in the past seven years? Yeah. Uh, well, a couple of things. Uh, for personally, I do, um, as well, I, you know, the, the, the normal things like exercise and eat right and uh, stuff like that, I, I try and do a lot of reading. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges and the thing that helped me the most survive this pandemic and being shut down for two years um, is uh, having uh, book club discussions with my teachers, with students via Zoom. And, you know, it's very interesting where you can take a title of a book and use that, that uh, non-threatening uh, book conversation and really bring out the emotions that people are experiencing at the time through the stories in the book. As you say, hey, you know, this character experienced this. Let me tell you what happened to me the other day. And, yeah. you know, so, so what, what happened in the past two years is in being as isolated and having the challenges and, you know, the stress of the job, you know, having these periodic book clubs spread throughout the entire two years with different groups really allowed me to have these, these conversations, uh, coaching conversations that really allowed me to express my feelings under the umbrella of a book discussion. And so, um, you know, I, I give kudos to my teachers, to my admin team, to my community for showing up and listening and allowing me to share and be vulnerable, but also giving them the opportunity to let me know how they feel, which ultimately impacts some of the decisions we made as a district. 
you know, and safety procedures and stuff like that. So that that's one kind of a personal uh, example. And then the professional example and how to navigate. We have a lot of conversations with, with uh, for me, uh, is our community members, giving them opportunities to share and express, giving students the opportunity to share and express my labor groups, our, our labor unions that we have in our district. We meet with them on a regular basis. My leadership team kind of having the same, asking the same questions and the same conversations that kind of calibrate how are people doing? What are the issues you're facing? And, and taking this collective feedback and then using that to help guide conversations with my board of education or with my executive cabinet to say, okay, here's what they're saying. Here's what we need to do. Yeah. Is, the, is there anything in particular that you do when you're in those meetings? Like you mentioned the book and I love that because uh, for me, I, I'm a big believer in story and the power, exactly how you said it, that mm -hmm. when we're looking at a story, there's something about a story that we can step into and we're telling the story or whether we're reading it, reading a book together and using those stories as a, as a sort of, sort of opens the gate to explore other things that otherwise can be hard to naturally step into with a group of people you're working professionally with or with students. Um, what else have you learned about when you're in those meetings with the different stakeholders, how to drive, how to, how to listen well, how to collaborate well? It sounds like you've the last couple of years. How have you done that? What have you learned? Yeah, what, we, what I've learned is to talk less and listen more, <laughs> believe it or not, you know, and so... It, it, and, and the other thing that I've learned that, that has really worked out well, you know, as, as much as I like to talk and as much as I'd like to think I'm in charge, um, I get other people to kind of facilitate the conversations so I can be a listener. I can engage in the dialogue. I can't facilitate and engage at the same time, nor can I facilitate and comprehend. So I really, we either bring staff, outside staff to come in and facilitate conversations or will assign an internal staff member and um, to facilitate the conversations that will allow me to be in breakout groups or will allow groups to come to me and say, hey, here's, here are some things that we want to share. And just listen. You know, it's, so, it's, it's something that's so simple that some people find so hard to do. And I think yeah. being, being better listeners and, and doing more listening and less talking is going to benefit the organization as a whole. It's funny. I was literally talking to someone about this yesterday, and we were we were talking about this this idea. And I said, "Okay, here's, here's a challenge for to pause for ten seconds in your conversations." conversations. And I, I say this all the time, but um, I find that this is where people often have the biggest epiphany about. I think what we generally miss is how often when we jump in and talk again, we actually cut someone off or cut off a different thought. And when we stay quiet, particularly for leaders where, you know, great leaders, you want your people to be smarter than you. You want, you, you want to have decisions as close to the ground as possible. So you want to do as much. If there's anyone who should be doing even more listening than, than any other role, it's the leader. And, uh, and so sometimes just practically counting i know it sounds funny but that's that's what's really helped me when i do coaching or when i'm in a in a room is i sit in the awkward silence and i literally will count <laughs> if they can't see me if i'm on a phone call i'll count with my fingers because it's that like <laughs> uh you know and, and i just and it's it's amazing how um you know if you count to 10 you you get to seven or eight yeah and 90 percent of the time the person yeah. goes someone else comes in you know someone has spoken up will we'll step in and speak working on one set yeah you were the thought that those seven seconds they weren't just sitting there waiting for me at all they were actually collecting their thoughts they were actually um having a ah uh, you know sort of moment and yeah. i reflect now and i think wow i must have missed that so often before yeah. i started pausing pausing more because that's a long time 10 seconds is a long a long time and i feel like listening it, it takes a, it takes a lot of intentionality and a awkward silence it sure does and you know and 
a lot of heartaches too because I've I've gotten myself into a lot of trouble with parents, with students, with uh, labor groups, with my board members, my bosses, um, cutting them off or kind of interjecting at a point where they were still trying to express themselves. And over time, I've learned to just different skills and strategies to 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 be a better listener, but also read the room in the sense where if I'm in a collective group and two people are dominating, you know, then some of the strategies I'll do is like, I'll either call on an individual and say, you know, um, Michael, hey, you haven't said anything. Uh, how do you feel about what we're talking about? Or uh, if I get a sense that people are just like shy and, and if I call Michael out, then I'm going to, I'm going to damage his psych, his psyche even more Then I'll say, Hey, uh, let's hear from somebody who hasn't talked yet. Uh, let's hear from a different perspective or let's hear other ideas from people. Yeah. So over, t- over time I've been able to, and, and again, these are like little tools that I've picked up from my mentors, uh, observing them in, in the meetings that they're facilitating. And then um, a lot of trainings that you go to, you know, we have to constantly build our skill. And even though we think uh, we miss you know, I go, I like to go periodically to just to, to validate I'm on still on the right track or to see if things have changed and, um, yeah. you know, pick, pick up those skills. Have you, um, have you come across the book, Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss? No, I haven't. Have you come across that yet? Yeah, it's, no, it's fairly recent, uh, but it's, it's the book that I'm recommending the most to oh, other people at the moment. Yeah, and it's that. So Chris is an FBI negotiator, a hostage negotiator who's been in like positions in uh-huh. hostage negotiation. The book is all about the FBI, me, where they realized um, a lot of the theories around negotiation and, and even listening. Uh, wow. When you had a when you have hostages to get free and you've got no room for compromise. They realized that a lot of the tactics weren't working, so they basically went back to square one. And, and he talks through what they found from, from trial and error and, and these incredible stories of how uh, they used all these different philosophies. And it's, it's just one of my favorite books. His explanation on mirroring and listening is that it just has a different angle on it and a different depth yeah. that I haven't come across. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's a great book for... Um, for listeners, but also, so, um, Jerry, I, I, you know, when you recommend a book and someone comes back and says that was a game changer, it's also one of those books. And I'm always uh, aware yeah. when I recommend something, you see what people say. And I, every yeah. time I recommend that, split the difference, people always come back and say, Jono, that was, that was a game changer. I loved every nice. page. So that's, uh, that's one of the most recent things I've read that I really loved around listening. I'm going to have to add that one to my list. Yeah. Um, as we jump into Leadership Express, as we sort of um, move towards wrapping up, uh, I'd love to ask you, Jerry, what you've gifted to other people or recommended over the years. The most recent one that I'm reading currently is Think Again by Adam Grant. Have you heard of that one? Yes. I, I, well, I have. I haven't read it. I need to read it. Have you, do you follow oh, yes. Adam Grant on social media at all? I do, yes. Man, he is. That I I would say he is probably the most profound. Like everything he writes, always like, where is he getting this? This is just <laughs> he he's he's a brilliant thing. Oh, I haven't yes. read it, but it's it's I, I've had it highly recommended. So I'll I'll, I'll add that yes. to my list. That's great. You got um, it. What's a what's a re- leadership lesson you've learned for the first time or been reminded of? I'm sorry, say that again. What's a recent leadership lesson you've learned for the first time? The, the importance of reverse mentors. Having reverse mentors. And, and here's, what I, here's what I mean by that. So as I navigate my career, as I, as I get older and my thinking or, or traditional, you know, in my thinking, it is important for me to have reverse mentors who are in this new and innovative space to keep me grounded as a superintendent, to keep me in the know, 
uh, make sure that I yeah. understand and, and am aware new and emerging trends. And, you know, I don't often get that in my superintendent collaboratives that I uh, am part of because, you know, we're all roughly the same age and we're all trying to, we're all thinking the way that we were taught and based on the leadership's um, uh, evolution of leadership development that we received. And what I've, what I've been reminded of and really reflected on is how important it, it is for us, for the educational leaders to be in that space where we also have the ability to learn from the new and emerging researchers and educators. And so I have a handful, handful of educators that I highly respect, that I follow on social media, that I, that I have in my local networks and my national networks that I tap into periodically and say, hey, you know, what, what would you like your superintendent to, to do in this situation? Or what would you wish your superintendent knew more of? And so that's how I, it's important for me to stay relevant that, in that respect. And, and board members are getting younger, teachers are getting younger, parents are getting younger, and they're demanding this, this new, you know, change or this updated skill set. Mm, I love that reverse mentors. I've had, it's come up a few times actually on the podcast. So I think it's brilliant. You okay. mentioned, mentioned it again. Um, thank you for, for that. Great recommendation. Sure. What, what about a, uh, a tip? What's one tip you would give, say, to younger leaders about work-life balance or work-life integration? I would say that um, it, you can't take, you can't be an effective leader and you can't take uh, care of others if you don't take care of yourself mentally and physically and I know as 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 we evolve and as we begin our careers and evolve in our careers you know we want to do the best we can do for our schools or for our profession and at some point we have to do a better job of, of learning how to say no to things and to, to finding that balance because you don't get the time back I became a high school principal at a very young age when my two children were very young. And unfortunately, I missed out on a lot of their, you know, growing up in that sense and a lot of their activities, weekends, events, because I had to work. And at the time, it, it, it felt like the work was important because I had thousands of kids that I, had to, I was responsible for and had to take care of. But reflecting on it, you know, I missed out on a lot and I don't get that time back. And so for any new and emerging leader, um, it's important that you just find that balance. And in some cases, you're going to have to have your, your friends, your colleagues, your parents, your grandparents, uh, other people just help you, help remind you that, you know, that is important. Put the phone down. Let's, we, we, you know, we, we make it a priority, make appointments to go get our haircut or go get our car service. Very rarely do we make time to spend with loved ones or schedule time to you know just be you know read a book or stuff like that so that's the biggest reminder and reflection and recommend you know just advice that i would give new and emerging leaders yeah thank you for sharing that uh, mm -hmm. so what is a uh a big struggle or problem the educational leaders facing right now well um, I think the challenge is all in the political environment in our respective areas, given the mess that's happening across our country, across the state, across the, the globe, having to deal with the socio-emotional um, frustrations uh, of being, um, you know, on lockdown for a number of years and then the anxiety of coming back and either am I learning like I should, or am I teaching like I should, or am I leading like I should? And just, you know, it, it just get right now that the emotional state of the adults and the kids is just, it's very challenging right now, which is why a lot of people are leaving the education profession because it's mm. just, they're, you know, it's, it's just not as appealing as it was, but we got a lot of stuff thrown at us. And now we have to, you know, it's going to take people to, to help navigate through these difficult times. For me, it would be very easy for me to retire. I'm close to retirement age. I've been doing this for a long time. But, you know, i just drawn back to having to see this thing through and, and being able to pass the torch on and leave my district in, in a peaceful uh, manner 
with direct, you know, with some sort of sense of belonging and, and um, meaning for the community. You know, not that we're doing things right or I'm perfect or I'm the say all be all, but just really bringing a sense of calmness and, and stability to the district uh, is what, what's keeping me coming back. Mm -hmm. That's great, Jerry. Uh, last question. If you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader, what would you say? Of leadership advice? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yeah, if you could only give one piece of leadership to a young, what would you say? I would say that you belong. Uh, you know, you belong. If you feel, if you feel it, in, if you, you j just people around you, if you, if it's in your heart and your gut, and it's something that you enjoy and are passionate about, just know that you belong. You know, the the the, the career path will take off. People will will tap you on the shoulders and say, "Hey, have you just find what you're passionate about." learn all about it, be the best at what, what it is, and, and then come to the realization that you belong. But that's great advice. Uh, well, for those who've really enjoyed listening to you, uh, just, just wondering, wondering if it's anywhere on Twitter uh, that people can find you or follow you, Jerry. Yeah, I do have a, a LinkedIn, I have a Twitter, I have an Insta Instagram, and I have a Facebook, but I also want to let you know I have two. Uh, I'm also a TED Ed Innovative Educator, and I have two TED Talks out on the web as well. Wonderful. Yeah, well, people can, can check that out. That's great. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in, and uh, today's episode's been a lot of fun and just great wisdom from Jerry and great stories too, uh, those, t those two stories. Um, from his mentor and, and then about being in hospital seven years ago have are, are really going to stick with me and I know they're going to help a lot of people as well. Um, so uh, don't forget for our listeners, I also have the John O'White Leadership Podcast and the Leadership Question of the Day podcast that you can go and check out to invest in your leadership. But I want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to you, Jerry, for being so generous with your time, uh, for sharing your wisdom with us, like I just said, and uh, and yeah, for just being such a joy to have on the podcast. Thank you so much. Absolutely. My pleasure. And thank you so much for the invitation. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage, consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders 
And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John O. White, or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. 95% uh, of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.